I, I don't need to introduce myself. You all know who I am. And I, um, I'm Ted Edwards. I'm W3TB. I can stay over here. W3TB and, um, and G0PWW. And I'm going to be talking about off-center fed antennas, which I really love off-center fed antennas. And I, that's no secret either. Um, as of a week and a half ago, I am no longer president of Tennessee Contest Group because my second term expired. K4RO is president now. Um, and I'm going to be talking about using OCF dipoles, and it's in the context of ham radio contesting because I like doing that stuff. Um, the, um, or why Ted likes OCFs, and I do like them, and I've ser they've served me well for years. Um, just a sequence of what's going to happen here. Um, I keep on turning around because I, I can see the screen, but if I do that, I'm in the way of the camera, right? No. Okay. Um, you're not contesters, some of you. Uh, some of you are. If you're not, the Georgia QSO party goes this weekend. It's a great place to play and get started. Um, but I'm going to be talking about what places do you really want to work if what you're doing is contesting and uh, where those places are really. And then we're going to talk about off-center fed antennas and, do, and modeling. I'm going to use ham radio computer modeling to produce some of the stuff that's here. And some other time, I think I'd like to do a presentation about modeling itself because it's great stuff to play with. And keep on going with the slides. And uh, how did it all work out? I'm going to have to do some geography, some antenna modeling, some putting it together, and do all that in the time constraints. I saw the time constraints as an issue. And, you know, I could do this all day, but I'm not going to. Um, a little, just a little bit story. Back in 1997, when I was still on active duty in the Navy, I got orders and I went to Groton, Connecticut, submarine capital of the world, and I stuck up a off sea center fed antenna, started working some contests, started submitting some scores, and Yankee Clipper Contest Club got a hold of me. That's the regional contest club up in New England, and invited me to the meeting. Um, and what I learned there from someone was something I kind of knew already, and that's that spreading out amateur radio activity around the world, the concentrations, the big ones, are North America and Europe, followed by South America and East Asia, that is to say mostly Japan. And um, if you really want to work contests, if that's what you want to do, and I do, then you've got to have an antenna that serves Europe first. And then you can add South America and the Orient. But get Europe first. Um, this is the Mercator's projection of the world. This was on the wall of your classroom when you were a kid. You've seen this map a thousand times. And it's amazing how many people think the world really looks like that. Uh, because we saw it every day, all the way from like first grade to through high school. And um, that map taught you, falsely, that Europe is east of here, California is west of here, and if you keep on going west, you get to, say, China, which on a steering of a ship basis, moment by moment, aiming yourself, that would be true. It's not the shortest route, but that's your orientation of the world. Maybe this is your orientation of the world. Uh, let me encourage you to get rid of that and go to the azimuth equidistant projection of the world. Now, this was in your study material when you were studying for your general class, although it wasn't when I was studying for my general class back when the world really was black and white like TV sets are, were. Um, but this is the equidistant, azimuthal equidistant projection of the world. Azimuth meaning direction. Equidistant means everything is measured from the point in the center of this. And this is an azimuthal equidistant projection of the world based on Franklin, Tennessee. Um, and I, I mentioned down here at the bottom, ns6t.net has a wonderful website that will create this for you. You put in the center point of the location, and it will create it for you, and you can copy it, which is how I got a hold of this one. This map will show you where Europe is, where Brazil is, where Japan is, and uh, they're reciprocal. And I think I can display that a little bit better by going to a bigger one here. From the center point, which is here, the yellow line will show you which direction Europe is. It's not east. 45 degrees or so azimuth will take you right through the middle of Great Britain, down through the middle of Europe, to Saudi Arabia, and off into the world. 
Um, that's where you want to aim an antenna if you're trying to work a lot of Europeans. The red line shows something that is absolutely wonderful about the eastern United States. And that is that the line of 150 degrees to the middle of South America and 330 degrees to Japan is opposite each other. So you can have one antenna that's of a pattern in opposing directions and have a second antenna. The first antenna needs to do Europe. The second antenna, if it does South America for you, will also do Japan for you. And that is a great thing. That's not true very many places in the world, but it's true here, which is, a, which is wonderful to take advantage of. And I just put this one up here about where is the rest of the USA really? Remember the Mercator projection said California is west? Well, it sort of is if you're in the Imperial Valley or San Diego. But most of California is west-northwest of here. So if you're aiming antennas wanting to do a lot of domestic operation, um, don't aim west thinking you go, oh, I'll get all those Californians. Okay? Doesn't happen that way. Um, this is just a, a shrunk version of the same map. Um, now to the antennas. Back in the 1920s, Lauren Windham, for whom the Windham antenna is named, and some other guys up in Ohio were experimenting around and they saw it, found out that if you take an 80 meter kind of dipole and not feed it in the middle, but feed it one third of the way from an end, therefore two thirds of the way from the other end, um, that you could operate it on multiple frequencies. Now their antenna was not one like you and I have that has some kind of an insulator or a ballot in the middle. It was just a wire fed with a single feed wire that was one third of the way from the end. But they played around with this. Uh, Lauren Windham wrote up the article about it in, the, in, a, in QST in 1929 and the antenna got named after him. You know, a lot of the things we talk about, about units of measure, electricity, energy, and they are named after the people who created them. You know, well, who was Coulomb anyway? You know, who was Ampere? You think about those kind of things. This antenna became named the Wyndham antenna. A proper Wyndham antenna is a single wire, not fed in the middle, but also with a single wire coming out of a tuner. That was great in 1929. Nobody does that anymore. But in 1980, in 1980, I happened to move, and I needed to do an antenna, and I read up in uh, 73 magazine this article about this off-center fed Wyndham called the Wider Wyndham, written by WA4PYQ. And his antenna is the one that you see in the drawing there. That's actually right out of the magazine. It was a 80-meter off-center fed dipole. Dipole doesn't have to be fed in the center. Dipole just means got two poles. That's all it means. So um, what, uh, what WA4PYQ did was to feed this thing at the one-third point. I'll call that 33% from the end, just for convenience. And um, because he had trouble feeding it, he fed it through a 48-foot piece of TV twin lead. Remember TV twin lead from the old TV antennas, 300 ohm line? He fed it through 48 feet of that stuff. Then he played around and determined that experimentally. A four to one ballon and 75 ohm coax to the shack. He thought this was a 400 ohm antenna. So I built one of these and I used it for years and it worked really well. It's not supposed to work on 15, but it did, which is fun. Um, you know, under the principle if you put RF down a coax and put it on an antenna, RF got to go somewhere. So it did. And I did that antenna for many, many, many years. You also find that the footnote there in 73 magazine of 1980 September issue. That's Lauren Wyndham himself. He was not an engineer. He was not an electrical guy. He was an attorney, as it works out. And he was um, an adjutant general of the Ohio National Guard when he retired. That's a picture of him from, I'm told it's 1955. Um, there have been other ones you see in, in CQ magazine. These ones from KC1DSQ and W1IS have come out in the past couple of years. Um, this one is also a 135 foot kind of antenna. It's got a little capacitor they stuck out there so that when you're running out on high multiples of the band, it'll pretend or at least convince the antenna operation that there's an insulator out there, and there isn't. Um, I've built this. I didn't found it particularly worked well. 
Um, this is the one I'm talking about here from CQ Magazine, November 2018. If anybody wants to send me an email and ask for that, I will send you a copy of this article. It's a, it's a tremendous one. And the reason I'm using this one is that it's shorter. It works 40 through 10, but it's 68 feet long. Th this antenna, I, I'm particularly using this one now because a lot of you don't have a land to put up 135 feet of wire, and so it's not helpful to talk about 135 feet of wire to people who can't get it up anyway. But most of you can probably get up 68 feet. And this antenna is what I've got set up. Some of you borrowed one from me and have used it at your QTHs. I made one up, and it is now at the Boy Scouts place up here. Uh, and that's where it came from, but it's, it's this one right here. Good for residential lots because it's smaller. It's got a different feed point. This is 41% from one end. And, but it's fed with 200 ohm, at a 200 ohm point. I'm going to talk about that. It'll operate four bands, including 15 meters. Works really good. Um, four to one current balance and 50 ohm coax back to the shack. And the dimensions of this, one side is 27 feet and the other side is 41 feet. And um, there's the footnote for the article. A couple of opportunities come with an OCF, one of which is, see I'm going to get over here actually, if I, just if I can, where I can see your screen, because I'm turning around and that doesn't help when I'm trying to talk, right? Um, one of the things is, that's great is you can use one antenna for four bands, and if you're on tight residential space, that's probably a really handy thing to be able to do. Um, you can um, Choose the orientation of which trees you hang it on to get the directional pattern you need, which is why I started by talking about geography. And it's a great fit for residential lots. The problems are, the problems are that um, dipoles work at a fundamental, fr I can, can I come over here where I can actually see your screen? Is that gonna be in the way? I kinda wanna turn around. Dipoles fed at a middle point, like you make your standard dipole, will not work at even multiples of the frequency. You probably tried that, found it didn't work very well. Um, so you want to find a feed point that allow you to do multiple things with the same antenna. You get right down to it. It can be done, it's easy to do. And I'm going to, I don't mean to get out of your way here, but I'm going to use, I want to see if I can, will this work? Not that, excuse me. Yeah, that. Do I get my little red pointer here? It's, too, it's very small. Okay, we, kind of we won't use it. A principle you all, 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 we all learned and never talk about from when we were first licensed is that on an antenna like a dipole, power is equally distributed everywhere on the antenna. We never talk about that once we pass our exam license. But power is the product of multiplying volts times amps. Intensity times electromotive force. So anywhere on the antenna, you take those things and you measure RF voltage and RF current and multiply them out, you ought to always get the same number. It doesn't literally work that way sometimes when we build faulty antennas, but power is the product of those two things. Now you feel I, I, I wanted, I, instead of just talking about it, I put these, this graphic up here because some people learn graphically instead of audio. I'm one of those people. They're four, all four of those are, just think about them as 40 meter dipoles. The top one is a 40 meter dipole fed at 40 meters. And on a dipole kind of antenna, at the ends where the insulators go, voltage is high and current is low. And that arch that you see represents current. And it's the current flowing through an antenna that radiates for you. Voltage is high and current is low at the ends. The middle of a standard dipole is a quarter, it's a half wave dipole, so it's a quarter wave from the middle to the ends, and the opposite is true. Current is high and voltage is low, which is why you feed dipoles in the middle. Okay, All right, that's, that's like the whole short course on dipoles. But um, if you tried to feed power in where voltage is high, it reflects back, you get SWR problems, you get power coming down the outside of your braid of your coax called common current, which is a problem if you've ever had a lot of common current. And so you feed a dipole in the middle. It's going to be about 50 ohm feed. 
You read them up as a practical matter, they're 50 to 75 ohms, depending on environmental factors like how high in the air you've got, and what it's made out of, and what's near it, like buildings or trees, and you know, it's not going to really be, be by the book. But 50 to 75 ohms, and fed in the middle, where current is high and voltage is low. Come down to the second one, same dipole, fed at twice the frequency, now fed at 20 meters, 14 megahertz. And what happens? The dipole is now a full wavelength long, and voltage is high at the middle and current is low in the middle. Try to feed it there, you don't get much. When I was a young teen ham, back when the dirt was new and, and that sort of thing, when I was a young teen ham, I uh, had a 80 meter dipole and I was on 80 meters, crystal controlled, if you remember those days we had to use crystal control as novices. And, and I had a great dipole working on 80 meters, but everybody was talking about how wonderful 40 meters was, so I wanted to do that. And I got in my bicycle one day after school with 35 cents, because that's what I could buy a crystal with, and I went to the radio store, and I bought a crystal that would put me up on 40 meters, and I stuck it in the radio, and it didn't work. It was awful. I had a terrible time trying to get power to load on, on forward, and my friends across town couldn't hear me. What I was doing was this second one here. I was feeding at a high voltage point, but I didn't know that. I later learned. But back in those days, um, I won't even mention the year, I, uh, KN3UWF had a lot of trouble trying to get on 40 meters. That's, but I was doing it because I was feeding it where voltage was high and current was low. The third one down would be 15 meters. Now three times the frequency, 21 megahertz. And once again, you see that current is high once again because it's three quarters of a wavelength now from the middle to the ends. And a lot of people have had a lot of success running 40 meter dipoles on 15 meters. It develops a pattern, a radiation pattern, but it takes RF, it puts RF out, you work stations. And that's a graphic representation of why. And the bottom one is for 10 meters and everything that was wrong on 20 meters now becomes wrong on 10 meters too. For the obviously and the same reasons. I don't think probably even have to talk about that. Now, left of the center in every one of these things, you see a little uh, kind of a red explosion kind of a dot and a uh, dotted line going through it. That's the 41% from the left side. And every one of those now has a point where current is flowing. None of them are perfect but they're all pretty good. Which means if you feed an antenna at that point and go through a four to one ballon to get up to 200 ohms, the antenna will be approximately a 200 ohm antenna at that feed point and you can operate it. And that's the simple explanation for an OCF. Okay? Um, and I found this works very well and some of you have used this and so have I. Um, the red dots scattered around there, that's because I screwed up making the graphic. They have no significance to them. <laughs> that's because I'm not a good graphics person. Uh, but does anybody have any questions about what we're doing by feeding this antenna off the center and what it allows you to do? There'll be some voltage there. It's not going to be a 50 ohm antenna. It's going to be an average of approximately 200 ohms, but not perfect. But you have one antenna that's going to do four bands for you, and that's really a good thing. Um, so, about modeling. Just so you don't get confused when you see something about the modeling I'm doing. There are uh, different programs that I use for modeling. The one I really like to use is written by some Japanese guy, and I got it from Britain. And do you remember when you were in school taking maybe a ninth grader, and you were taking algebra, and you learned about about x and y coordinates on a graph. x coordinates went left and right, y coordinates went up and down. You gotta love the Europeans, they do it backwards. So don't, don't get upset by what I'm gonna show you when the x coordinate goes up and down and the y coordinate goes left and right. Because that's the program I use to, to, to create some of this stuff. It's a British program, I spelled it the British way so that they wouldn't get upset. And, and on this when I put the wire on there, just for my own convenience, I put the wire in the modeling program so it runs straight up and straight down on the x-axis for this. Um, because 
you can take this graph that you end up making, put it directly on a map, the azimuthal equidistant map, and see your directional patterns of your antenna against the world, which is really kind of a handy thing. Um, and so I do it that way. And I also do it with the longer side of this antenna just further north than, than the middle. My convention, so it works well for me. Um, I, um, I, I'm going to show you things that are done at a takeoff angle of about 30 degrees. Nobody works DX at the horizon. Okay, it's all going to go up somewhat. If we're working DX, we generally are, are getting our best results at, at a takeoff angle of 20 to 30 degrees. So the modeling is all done at 30 degrees. And it's done with the antenna 15 meters high because this program is metric. And that makes 49 feet, just so you understand what I'm doing here. Um, and I don't account on, whenever I do this, you really can't account unless you're really good at modeling for the sag that happens when you stretch a wire across. You can't pull a wire tight enough to be flat. We call antennas like that flat top, but you can't make them flat. You really can't pull it hard enough to do it. And if you're supporting it in trees, it's not good for the tree. And when the windstorm comes up like it's done almost every Friday night for the past month, the tree's going to sway left and right. And if they sway apart from each other, you snap the antenna. So I tend to make my antennas with a fair bit of snag in them, uh, a sag in them because I don't want them snapping and I don't want to have to do repairs. Simple. Um, so let's go to 40 meters. First of all, in 40 meters. There's an SWR curve over there on the left in that graph. You can see the SWR is minimum 40 meters. You can look at the grayed out field, that little line in the middle, where I've chose to, to put it in both horizontal and vertical. That's what VNH stands for, horizontal and vertical. And you get antenna radiation patterns there. And I'm only going to do this on 40 meters. But you, you see the one that looks like an infinity symbol with a figure eight laid over sideways? That's the horizontal pattern. And the thing that looks like an eight is the vertical pattern. Um, from here on, I'm going to use patterns that are combined of the two by checking the box that says total when I made the other ones. But I want to show you that this can be done. You can see the horizontal and vertical elements of your antenna radiation pattern very e easily and very directly. Now that box with the graph on there, the second column, the first column has some frequencies sampled in the band. The second column under the letter R is the impedance. Um, and you can see that on these ones, you've got impedances that are in the 110, 115 kind of range. If you take a 200 ohm feed point, you divide it by 110, 115, you're going to get a number less than two which will be the SWR. Everybody with me on that? The reference point is 200 ohms. The reality is not 200 ohms. You can divide those two and you can understand exactly what the SWR points that are on the graph on the left. Everybody's with me? Good. Let's make it a bit less complicated here. That pattern there is the combined horizontal vertical overall radiation pattern. And it's what you expect that left and right of the wire you're going to get maximum radiation and isn't that nice and it'll look like that at about 30 degrees takeoff angle. And um, you've got the numbers. Now below that one on the right it says 5.9 dBi. dBi and dipoles are Dipoles are, are, are what, 2.12 dB better than an isotropic spot in the universe? So this is about 3 dB better than a dipole and 3 dB better than a dipole. And that's half an S unit for those of you who on your receiver are looking at the S units all the time. Um, that's, that becomes a gain antenna in the side direction. Let's go to the next band, 20 meters. Take a look at the SWR minimum on, that on the left graph and you see that it has moved to the right of center a little bit. Still covers the band pretty well. Um, the, uh, 
I can't read it, it's 5.9, also DBI. I've got the total here, and there's a larger pattern to the north, if you want to think of it that way, than to the south. Why? Because the, I, the wire is oriented with the longer side further north than the south side is. Um, but look at the pattern. It's not an east-west pattern anymore. When I first started doing modeling, I kind of knew this, but I was surprised to learn, I was surprised to learn that when you run a, a wire at a multiple of a frequency and start developing pattern lobes, the east-west pattern that you saw on 40 meters kind of goes away. Look at those nulls left and right. That was astonishing to me when I first learned that. It explained a few things about the way antennas had been behaving around me for years. Um, but you start getting a pattern, the larger lobe to the north. You can see it's 260 or so ohms. 260 divided by 200 is going to be about 1.3 or 4, right? And that's reflected in the SWR curves. Three times the frequency. We're now on 15 meters. I don't have to keep on explaining this anymore, but look at the way the SWR minimum is creeped out the top of the band. See that? Hmm. For a CW guy like me, that's a problem. But you see the pattern. You're getting a radiation pattern. 10 meters. Again, you've got a radiation pattern. You understand about the pattern. The SWRs that are about 130 or so, 200 divided by 130 will give you about 1.6 maybe, something like that. And that's the SWR thing. So the, S, the, the radiations are, some are a little lower than 200, some are a little higher. None are really there. But they're close enough to you can live with them all. And now you've created a four-band antenna. And look at the gain, 7.7 .7 dB. Wow, that's better than a, that's a whole S unit in the favored directions. If you aim an antenna like this to take advantage of its p characteristics, you don't need a beam and a tower. I, I used to say when I was, until a week and a half ago, when I was president of the Tennessee contest group, I was the only president of a significant contest group in the United States that doesn't have a tower and a beam. Because I was able to make an antenna like this and take advantage of its, of its aiming characteristics. Now, I'm going to back this up. Is that where I want to be? Yeah. And, and take a look. They're all, this antenna in the, in the magazine article was created to be a broadband antenna for a lot of people. And a lot of those people are going to be phone operators. And they want the SWR to be better at the top of the band. I'm a CW guy. I own a microphone. Wow. I, I dust it off a couple of times a year. Um, but I want my, my antennas to be lower in these curves than they were. So what I did is I took that 41 foot side of the antenna, I made it 42 feet long. That was a bit too much. I trimmed it off by a standard measurement, which is the length of my finger, and brought it down um, to a point where I was at basically just above 7.0, which, which took all of those curves and moved them to the left, which worked out well for me. And that's what I'm running at home now. That was my modification of it because I need, a sig I need an antenna that does CW for me. If it'll do foam, that's nice. Um, but I moved all those curves. You see where that one is? I moved that one to the left, that one to the left, and that one to the left. Yes? Ted, quick, quick question for you. The modeling software that you're using, what are the variables that you have to plug in there to get the answer? Repeat the question. He wants to know what are the variables are in modeling software. And I've been thinking of putting together a modeling software presentation for another time and place, because I got a time limit here. <laughs> and, um, and, and I will do that. But basically, the, you're, you're entering um, on XYZ Cartesian kind of coordinates, uh, the length of wires, how high they are their orientation. I just orient my wires north and south all the time. And a lot of these programs have the ability, once you've got your antenna like that, if you want to steer it, you have ability to rotate it in increments, which is a cool thing. But I, that, that's basically the wires. Sometimes the wire size, you know. When I was in graduate school, I had antennas made up with number 24 green enameled belt wire because nobody could see them. And I couldn't have antennas where I lived. 
that, but I was sitting there assuming that putting 100 watts on a wire like that, it was air cooled and it, <laughs> and it worked. But, but, but it very, huh? When you use height, are you using the height at the peak point or? Every point, you're, you're entering the, the dimensions of a wire, this end and that end. You could vary each one separately. On this MMA and A program, you actually build it on the ground and then raise the whole antenna up, unless you wanted to have an inverted V kind of a situation where you could do that manually, okay? What I did here is I, I made all my SWRs work for me by making the long side longer. I sometimes wish I'd done the short side and try and play with it, but I didn't. Um, now that looks like a bug that hit my windshield on the way driving down here today. But this was made actually with the other program. And this was made with a different OCF. But if you look at the black oval, you can see the 40 meter oval, see it? If you look at the dark blue one, that would be the 20 meter pattern. If you look at the green one, that would be the, um, the 10 meter pattern and let your mind just interpolate the 15 meter pattern in between them. But that was, ultimately the patterns. And I, what am I going to do about taking these lobes and take advantage of them? Well, what I did was I looked at how many of these in the upper right are close to the 45 degree line. I said, I want Europe. What am I going to do? When I built the antenna that this related from, I looked at my trees and I said, you know, if I choose my trees carefully and I'd like to turn it like 12 degrees off of north, well, I had, I didn't have 12 degree trees, but I had 15 degree trees. And that'll have to be good enough. And I put it up and it worked great. And all my patterns worked out so that I got lobes towards Europe, lobe towards South America, lobes towards Asia, and other lobes that went out into the Pacific, which I figured, okay, that's wasted time. Except I found myself working a lot of Australians and New Zealanders. And that's good. Um, but the point is, if you take this, an antenna like this and you understand where the lobes are, and then you look at your ability to put it up in the air and support it, you can take advantage of that, which is what I did. And um, my, my only recommendations about that, look and see where your trees are, look at what, see, see what you've got, figure it out, figure out what you want to work. Maybe you don't want to work DX contesting like I do. Maybe you have other considerations. Figure out what you want to work, what will support your antenna, and with an antenna like this, see if you can support it at the feed point. Because the feed point's got a ballon and that's heavy. Coax is going up to it, it's heavy. If you can support that weight, your antenna will live longer. Like Hiram Percy Maxim, the founder of the RRL once said, if your antenna stays up all winter, it's not big enough. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, along came that big storm when I was off to England. We had that really bad, bad, bad windstorm back in February. Every antenna that I had came crashing on down, except for my off-center fed, which is supported in the middle. Um, but uh, I, I want to go to just one more slide here. That is the SWR minimums of this. I'll, I'll calculate it out. You see the frequencies. The only fault in this is where it says 10 meters, 336 ohms, that's a typo. I put, meant to put 136 there. Um, but you get multiple SWRs that work. None of them are perfect, but now you're on four bands with one antenna with it you steered, oriented towards what you want to work, and that's all good. And this, this is on our website. And uh, when I talked about this a couple of years ago, um, one of the hams here among us, who is better than I am at graphic stuff, um, was able to take the map and the antenna patterns and lay them on top of each other. And I don't know how to do that because I really don't know my PowerPoint very well. And put a little engine on the top here, <coughs> which is off the graphic. But you can go to this on our, our WCARES website and you can steer the antenna at 10 degree intervals around the globe and see what will happen if you take advantage of you measure these trees, this is where they are, what it will look like. You can do that on our WCARES website, which I think is really slick. Um, 
That's where I live. Uh, you can see the southwest to northwest line and the tree in the middle. And that was all great until I had to take that tree down. <laughs> so much for my center point. So I did some more measuring and thinking about it, and that's what I have now, which is running sort of west northwest to east southeast. And it took the lobes, but it relayed them on top of my desired directions again. And that's supported on a tree right now. That's what I have, have right now here in Franklin. And that is the end of what I wanted to say. Thank you all. Have a good morning. <laughs>